I kind of wrestled with what exactly I would talk about today because we've been in series of things and I've been here and I've been there. We've kind of navigated all types of situations, I think, in the last, uh, oh, at least the last few weeks since we stopped my series on the Holy Spirit. So I thought that I would actually take uh, the time today to ask a few questions that might bear fruit for some, hopefully. Um, maybe of, even though it's a celebration day, maybe of what, what you're going through and where you might be at in your walk today. I wonder how many people last, in the last week, in the last month, maybe over the last year, have felt that their petitions and their pleas have been answered by God, by God giving them the bread, we'll call it the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. And if there, if there are people here listening to me who have felt that way, I have a message for you. <laughs> Maybe you are exhausted in the trouble of your soul. I have a message for you. What about those people who seem to be walking in the pathway and there is no progress? You feel like you should be walking in God's bright light and yet you feel like you are walking in darkness and he isn't there. I have a message for you. <laughs> now, if you came in <laughs> and you're none of that, trust me, you will be eventually. <laughs> Don't worry. That's, that's the wonderful thing, is if you're really walking with God at any given time, even today is a great day, tomorrow might be an even better day, and the day after, but next month, or it could be next week, next month, next year, whatever happens comes your way, and you kind of fall back into how did that happen, and why is that happening? And So I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to lift some things out of this book. And we're going to add some color. I'm going to give you a little bit of history. And then we're going to make an application. Isaiah 30. And verse 21 says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Now, if you're scanning your Bible and you're looking for that particular verse, you notice that what comes right before it is, though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, you shall not, yet shall ye not thy teachers be removed in a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. In that same chapter, there is another verse I'd like you to pay attention to, and that's in verse 15. Isaiah 30, verse 15. In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall your strength, shall be your strength. And I end right there. I'm taking liberty a little bit today. Now, what was said behind the scenes that brought the prophet to address these words to the people? It's kind of interesting. So bear with me. I'm going to navigate some history real quickly because it's important. It will bear fruit when we get to see the big picture. The backdrop of this is the rise and fall of the Assyrian Empire and the attacks on the people of God throughout the duration of the Assyrian rule. The oldest reference to the Assyrian kingdom, when it was not yet a kingdom, is back in the book of Genesis, mentioned as the land or the place called Ashur. But the Assyrian campaigns that we can read about, you'll find them in Kings and Chronicles. Many of the prophets address these kings and their attacks, their leaders often coming in mightily, and then some fate happens to them. They're removed, their sons in their stead, they're killed, they're poisoned. It's a lot of intrigue and a lot of drama if you're interested in reading. It's not history that's boring whatsoever. 
But Assyria was often seen as a scourge to the people of God, as divinely permitted by God to attack his people. Oftentimes, God used different instruments to try and wake his children up. You know, that's how we are. We're kind of, at times, we're difficult, and God will use any method to wake us up. doesn't matter how we're woken up. As long as he wakes us up and we come to a fresh reality that he's the boss and he's in control, it's all good. But these Assyrians, if you follow the, the, the whole unfolding of, of the, we'll call it the reign of terror on the people of God, um, the end of which is the battle recorded in the Bible, the Battle of Carchemish, where basically with their allegiance and, and we'll call it a coupling with the Egyptians, both kingdoms will neatly kind of disappear. And what will remain will be the artifacts left in antiquity for hundreds of years later to be discovered, unearthed, and while people are still debating about the verity of recorded history in these pages, some of those artifacts not only confirm but absolutely say, yes, this indeed happened, and this is the way it happened. Even though it's recorded by heathen historians, it really does bring home the point of what this people, the Assyrians, what they did to oppress God's people. In fact, there is a relief on what is called the black obelisk. It's a picture, a depiction of Jehu, who was a king, who is basically groveling before one of these Assyrian kings. It's the only depiction we have, apart from a later artist who depicted King David solely with a fig leaf. But it is the only depiction in antiquity of a supposedly godly king, although we know Jehu was not, groveling before a heathen king, which gives you an idea of how oppressed the people were throughout history by this particular group, the Assyrians. If we follow a brief outline, the empire, by 1900 B.C., is rapidly extending its territory of trade all the way into, if you have a Bible map, look where Cappadocia is in East Asia Minor. It's remarkable that they extended their, their territory so quickly. Famed wars with kings like Hammurabi, who is famed for Hammurabi's code, um, important historical events. But what will really begin to happen is as the territory extends, there is less of a united Assyrian force, and it kind of breaks into city-states city for a time until they are reunited and seen as a real force to be reckoned with in history. By the time a man by the name of Tiglath Pileser, um, by the time of his reign in the Assyrian kingdom, he is the first recorded monarch of this type, with this magnitude of military force to march all the way to the edge of the Mediterranean. There's some interesting feats, if you'd like to call it that, by these people. But what first started out as just acquiring territory became an extreme exercise in cruelty, in brutality, in paying taxes and tribute if one did not pay the taxes and tribute mandated by the Assyrian forces. They stopped at nothing. So first it was just territorial. It escalated later to monetary, economic. And by this time, what we are encountering is a definite change simply from conquering territory to looking at how the people may even be moved out of the land somewhere else, invasion, and basically the taking over of land, property, and goods. So there is a big change. The oppression that is brought on against God's people is recorded in this book, and by the time of what I've just referenced in the book of Isaiah, we're dealing with, for the children of God, their king, King Hezekiah, and the leader of the Assyrians is Sennacherib. So that kind of brings you to the, the now of what's behind, what's going on in these chapters in the book of Isaiah. The verses that I have referred to have much to do with the fact that the children, God's children, 
because there's, there's a lot of dynamics in referring to one particular group. God's children have decided to rely heavily on the arm of the flesh, to lean on foreign gods that are mainly, we'll call them the forces, Pharaoh of Egypt becomes their best friend. They turn to Egypt for help instead of looking to God. And now we're caught up with what's going on. God's people are in terrible danger. They know that there is a siege that is about to befall them. And they are busy looking at the Assyrians' weaponry, their fighting men, and their focus is on what the enemy possesses to do war with them, not on God's word and God's promise. And this is, this is why I said to you, you can talk about history, but history has a way of repeating itself constantly. While the people's reply to God would be that they would be able to get on horses. If you read in verse 16, it says, For we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee. We will ride upon the swift. But God's answer to them will be, Hey, if you think that you're going to get in this battle and you're going to take off and flee on horseback, i got news for you. Your enemies, they've got horses too, and they'll come after you. Newsflash. So it seemed as though as the people, as we find them right here in these pages, there's something wonderful that becomes more and more apparent if you're reading through two chapters that go side by side, 30 and 31. That is, that instead of trusting God and relying on the Lord of hosts to win their battle, they were looking at every other method to win every other way but God. And there's a great lesson of comfort for us, not just today, but every day. The minute you start to look on whatever the attack in your life is, whatever has brought that bread of uh, affliction or the water, whatever it is that has brought the trouble, at some point, there needs to be some clarity that you can spend your time looking at what is being used against you or what you feel has burdened your soul or you can spend your time looking at the source of your strength and where it comes from. And when you figure out where your focus is, suddenly there's an interesting dynamic that takes place. For these people, I'm sure they cried out at some point, but their cry was not with the heart. This has been the lament of the prophet. It has been the lament of prophets through the ages and even today where people will speak great things and say, my God and God can, but the heart isn't there. In fact, there's a sharp rebuke multiple times to Isaiah, through the mouth of Isaiah, through the mouth of Jeremiah about people essentially wanting to call on the name of God, but the heart isn't even there. And in fact, they're so far away in their walk that even if God responded, they probably would not hear their distance, not evident to them, but to God, of course. Now, there is a, a victory that is delivered to the people that is unmatched, unparalleled, unprecedented. If you read about the events that occurred, the backdrop that I'm referring to, which occurred in 2 Kings... It's interesting, it says the angel of the Lord went out and one night, the very army that these people of God, although they were far away from following God, the people of God were threatened by. In one night, the angel of the Lord went out and he, the angel of the Lord slew 185,000 of the army of Sennacherib. And when the children of God woke up in the morning, all they saw in the camp were corpses of this army that was going to be so formidable in wiping them out. That only happened for two reasons. One, God gave them, when I refer to the passage that talks about bread and water, it sounds like prison fare, but bread of adversity, water of affliction, God brought that first to wake them up to the fact that whatever had come upon them was for a purpose, number one. Number two, if you keep reading, there's kind of some interesting things that happen in this chapter, but if you keep reading, you find that God has something very distinct to say to his people. He says, 
through the prophet, therefore will the Lord, therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. So there's this word of comfort, and then there's something else that's uttered that to me just makes this all come together, which is at some point in this chapter, as I reference verse 21, thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. Now, this won't make sense to anybody unless you follow the way I'm going to try and lay this down. And I don't mean that the Bible won't make sense. The essence of what I'm trying to say won't make sense. These people still carried the name of the children of God, the children of Israel. They still carried the name. And although they had essentially forsaken God's way, God had not forsaken them. And this victory that God delivers doesn't come just handed on a silver platter. Here, I delivered you from out of your enemy's hands, but rather, I gave you every single day, think about it, bread and water, which you would minimally need to live, I gave you something that afflicted yourself each and every day. Think about what that is in your life, something that Maybe it's a thorn like Paul had, a thorn in your side that seems to never go away. It might be a health condition. It might just be trouble of the soul, whatever it is, a burden for prayer for somebody who we know is sick. Maybe it's sickness yourself. Whatever that is, that is the affliction and adversity that somehow we think, well, I've been asking God, but I still have this. Remember, I preached a message, the message of the, the ministry of the thorn. Why is this thing not departing from me? But a lot of times in God's book, deliverance will not come until certain things happen. The reality that in their own strength, they could not deliver themselves. And until that became a reality, that no matter how much they could analyze the enemy's tools, their tactics, their amount of military might, until they came to the conclusion that without God, they couldn't win the battle. And when they ran out of their ideas, then God would enter in. And I think there's another wonderful thing about this where God says, if you think you can run away, I've said this before, God has an interesting way of boxing us in at times. There are people that will try and run away from something, like Jonah. But remember, when God really wanted to get to Jonah, he figured out these were the mechanisms to get Jonah somehow to get his attention. Okay, he found the ship going to Tarshish in the other direction. But eventually God gets Jonah's attention and eventually God accomplishes his purpose by sending Jonah to go and preach what he told him to do to go and preach at Nineveh, even if it was just to accomplish something for that specific time. So if you think that the solution is running away, it's not. It'll never be with God. And if God wants you to accomplish something, believe me, you can try and run away and you can play the coward, and you can play the peacemaker, but if God wants you to do something, believe me, he will make it so. I just used the example of Jonah, but trust me, there are abundant examples of people that cannot, you can't get away from the fact that it's in your face every day. God's trying to say, I have this thing for you to do. Now, as soon as you wake up from your stupor, <laughs> I might be able to help you out here. Now, there's another verse in here that I want you to focus on because there's, there are remedies in here given. Verse 15, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. Now, I want you to, if you want to circle in your Bible, in returning, that Hebrew word which we've looked at before, beshuba, which shub is to turn, usually, usually that is to, in our New Testament, to repent in returning and rest shall you be saved. In returning to what? It can only mean turning from your way, the way that you've gone, back to God and rest. So think of it. This is God's prescription for you and for me, those of us who have been eating and drinking the unpleasantries that, by the way, have come by the hand of God. Return and rest. A little R&R &R at God's hand. That's number one. You know that key word, 
I'm going to go back to this, return. Why? Because the children, God's children, in this particular instance, are acting as though there is no God. They may say, the Lord is our God, the Lord of hosts will be with us, but their actions were like people who had no God. And if you read the details, which are in Second Kings of this event, you find out that the behavior was lacking of people saying, I will trust and I will not be ashamed and I will wait patiently on the Lord. So the instructions, returning and rest, shall you be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Not you will get strength after you get rest. But in turning back to God and resting there. And that, let me just say, that rest requires faith. Rest doesn't come because you decide to kick up your feet. Resting, the type of resting we're talking about, requires great faith to be able to sit back and say, just like the psalmist said in Psalm 37, to wait on the Lord, roll your burdens, cast your cares upon him, wait on the Lord, that's Psalm 55 as well, but 37 that I'm speaking of. That takes faith that the Lord will do and enter in. Don't think rest as now I just sit back and do nothing. Think that rest requires faith. So in turning back to God and resting, and we'll call that resting faithingly, Shall you be saved in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Think of this. There are so many people who cannot take the instructions to just be still. Like God had said, be still and know that I am God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So many people who cannot take the instruction. Quietness does not mean that I do not speak or that somehow I lower my voice, but in quietness means to be still and recognize that the Lord is in control, and in confidence, which is to lean, our Hebrew word batak, to lean, to put all your weight upon as if, if you are falling, he will catch you. And it is that type of relying and waiting, resting, that does indeed, as I say, require faith, and those are the instructions to these people. And this is why it says in verse 18 that he may be gracious unto you and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. What struck me in all of this is the same thing that is said in the New Testament. Trials and testings are working out for us a far more exceeding weight of glory, that the things that do fall on us in the now are working out something that God has if we'll look to him and lean on him, rest, wait, be still and know that he is the Lord, he'll work it out. But when we quit trying to fix things, these we're still trying to fix, these we're still trying to do. And the fact of the matter is that no matter how you slice it, God was not going to enter in until the wake-up call came. Without me, God speaking, not Melissa Scott, God, without me, you can do nothing. When you come to that reality, there is such a great gateway that opens up. And I think about this. The walls of Jericho did not come down because a man or a woman took a, a jackhammer or took you know, something to destroy the walls. God brought those walls down. Everything that we read about where there is a great happening it is at the hand of God. Even the deliverance of the children of Israel. It wasn't because Moses said, let my people go. It was because God said, finally, I'll harden Pharaoh's heart once this happens and great miracles occur and all of these other things, and then I will lead you out. And later on, it's not Moses delivered you. Did I not lead you out with a strong arm? Did I not give you the ability to get riches? God speaking. So the minute we begin to recognize God was showing a pathway. And what is so great about this passage is that not only do we see the events unfolding, we can also take a little license. I imagine, and I'll just refer to it quickly so you don't have to try and find the place, but I imagine in the chapters that I've been referring to regarding this event where there is a great 
taking of the land and territory, before that event happens, I should say, um, before this doom and gloom is going to descend on the people, Sennacherib sends envoys to King Hezekiah, and basically they ridicule and they say, your God's not going to do anything. Look, look at how many men we have. Look at our fighting force. Look at what we have behind us. Maybe to the eyes of the people who live there, they said, yes, and this is bread and water of affliction and adversity. Maybe for them in their eyes, the fear and the panic. What's interesting is that Hezekiah says, don't listen to anything that's being said. These are, he's not saying this verbatim, this is first book of Scott, these are just threats. Stay still and trust the Lord. Don't be persuaded that these great swelling words that are being spoken can do anything to you. First book is God again. Whatever these people say, God will protect. God will enter in. God will do. And sure enough, they tell, Hezekiah says, don't answer these folks as they come with their threats. And they did not. And then in that same uh, area of don't turn there, but in the same area of Second Kings, in the 19th chapter, it talks about, it came to pass that night, the angel of the Lord went out, smote the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went and returned, and dwelt at Nineveh. And by the way, so 185,000 are wiped out by the angel of the Lord in one night. These are God's enemies because the people suddenly came to the conclusion that only God could deliver them, that only God could help them out, that only God could win this thing. And this is why when I'm looking at this, I think to myself, well, maybe we don't have the same type of mindset. Our enemies may be in our life or whatever is coming against us or the trouble of our soul maybe is not as magnitudinous as this army. But for you or for me, it may seem like it. And we have to come to the same conclusion that maybe the things that befall us are at the hand of God. And if we will stand still, return, rest, and I say this exactly the way the King James says it, be quiet or in quietness and confidence. The reality is that God will do your fighting for you. God will do the healing that you need. God will enter in to work his good. And there, isn't a, there is not a person on the face of the planet who can say, I called on the Lord and the Lord did not deliver me or the Lord did not hear my prayer. I've said many times, sometimes God is slow in answering our prayers. There are times when God says, no, I've told you the ministry of the thorn. Paul petitioned three times to pray earnestly that God would remove it and God basically said, no, my strength is sufficient. When we come to the end of our strength, then we are strong in him. When we've run out of our own ideas, when we've run out of our own weaponry, when we've run out of our own machinations, when we've run out of everything, then God enters in and says, I'll fight for you. And by the way, along the way, you might be or I might be just like Joseph, thrown into a pit by his brethren. He should have become bitter. He should have been angry. He should have said, I will revenge, and I will, but he didn't. He was in prison for a purpose. And that purpose ultimately is declared in the book of Genesis that had he not been placed there, his brethren would have been wiped out, and the end of the people as God had planned would have come to an end. He was falsely accused, thrown in a pit, and in prison for a purpose. Why? To save God's people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's going to have as dramatic a story as Joseph, but that is definitely bread and water of affliction and adversity, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Unfair, unjust, and yet God had a plan in all this, and the plan, there was something there. Who knows? Let me just say this one thing, because I know we've got a lot of young folks listening today. and Maybe you're not big into history, and you haven't gotten into reading all the complicated stories in the Bible. But there is something quite beautiful in this picture that I'm going to paint, really a lesson for our young listeners today who are in the sanctuary. I want you to pic picture a great expanse, a great body of water. 
go down to the beach and you look out and you just gaze out as far as you can see. And I want you to picture maybe a small bird, a small, small bird that's not really able to fly too far, too long, just flapping its wings and indulge me. The bird is trying to figure out how he will make it to his destination, being that he's so small and all the attempts of flapping his wings will take him nowhere, all this work for nothing. And a larger bird, picture some type of a large bird, a, I don't know, one of those pelicans maybe, they got the big wings and everything, comes along and says, little bird, come on, get on my back. Well, you know, he might be the little bird saying, oh, I'm too scared, that bird might swallow me up in a flash. But let's just say the bird said, I'm of God, all right, you can... Uh, you can count on me. I got, you know, I got the banner. I don't know, you know, bird pelican makes a sign of the cross. I don't know, okay? He just says, I'm a brother, all right? Get on my back. I'll take you there. And that little bird gets on the back of the big bird, but the little bird's still trying to flap its wings and still trying to make its way like, I can help, I can help. And the bird says, the big bird says, chill out, relax. I'm going to take you there. Now that you've gotten on board, you've got to trust me. I'm going to take you there. That's exactly the way it is with God. We spend most of our time flapping our wings and talking about how petrified we are and how long the journey and how tough it's going to be and how's this going to work out and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> when in fact God has said over and over again, come on, I'll take you, I'll take you there. Your work is to take that leap of faith and then once you get on, quit trying to fix, contribute, do something. Your, your calling is to faith and trust that the arms of the Lord are secure enough to take you and get you to where you need to go and deliver you out of your present situation, which is why I said there is no amount of trouble. We are, we, we are creatures of limitless capacity when it comes to trying to deliver ourselves, even if we think we're really not working at it, we are. Now, what about this voice behind us, this passage that I quoted that says about the voice behind you? What about that? What should we do with that? Well, let me tell you what we should do with that. There's a very strong message there. Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee. This is the way walk ye in it. Why behind thee? We always talk about the God of the forefront, the God who's on the corner before you get there, Right? Except in this case, the children of God had wandered off the track. And unlike the shepherd who would be guiding, they would be in his midst, these have gone ahead and apart. So listening for the voice that is behind is like saying, even if you've wandered off the track and you have veered from God's pathway for you, keep listening that Voice, you shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left, simply means even if you've gotten off track, children of Israel, if you've gotten off track, I'll tell you what to do if you'll listen to what I'm saying in the word. Not, not, not listen to me, Melissa Scott. God speaking to his people. If you listen to what I'm saying to you, I'll get you back on track. I know you're off the path. This is why you're having to listen to the voice behind you because you got so far ahead of where you were supposed to be by trying to solve the problems yourself that you're not even following me anymore, but I never stopped following you and I never left you and I never left your, even your erring ways. So if you listen to the voice that's behind you and the word that's coming from the Lord saying, this is the way, the way is not my way or your way, but his way. And once more, I love the simplicity of this because there isn't anything that says, now, once you turn, return, rest in quietness and in confidence. That will be your strength. Not how much strength you have left, but that stillness in resting in God to do will be your strength, will carry you, see you through. And in the returning process, getting back on track, you will hear my voice, God speaking to his people. You will hear that I haven't left you I have my promise to you is I will never leave you nor forsake you. I haven't. I've watched you. I've watched you go off the track. I've watched you wander far off. Why do you think the beautiful New Testament passage of the prodigal son, and it talks about the father looking and seeing the son come back, but do you really think that the father 
was absent to know that the son had gone. It says he went into a far country. Whoever is telling the parable, which is Jesus, happens to know our ways and that we are constantly wandering afar off. And I love the fact that in the Old Testament, David says, you know my thoughts, even when my thoughts are afar off, you know them. That means that that voice behind you is still trying to reach you today. And that voice behind you has said, even though you have walked off the pathway and the way I've given you, I haven't left you. Now, if you go back to the grace of the Lord, it says in verse 19, Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee. I would simply say, that's not a promise that you'll never have tears ever again. It means in turning and trusting the Lord, in that moment, your tears will turn from tears of sorrow to tears of joy, which eventually stop running, and they turn into the joy of the Lord and the happiness and the knowledge that when you thought everything was gone, when you were worried about looking at the swords and the rattling of the enemies, when you were busy focusing on everything else, your focus came back to, these are God's promises. My God can do anything. With God, nothing is impossible. I know that God will make a way if I will simply turn back to him, look on him. And by the way, when the storms of Galilee do indeed come, no, I won't be found asleep, but I'll be found resting. That's the Christ-likeness I'm searching for today. Whatever it is that is overtaking, whatever turmoil it is, that the peace that God says here, return and rest, that R&R of God, that's available to every single individual, young or old, whether you've been on the path or off the path, just requiring one thing. God doesn't say if you'll turn back to me and every day you'll, you'll have to do some new form of penance to get back to me. He simply says, turn. And that word constantly, even in the New Testament, to repent, which we got from the Latin, which really is a poor translation of what the Greek word means. With the mind, it means metanoia in the Greek. With the mind, turning from my thoughts and my ways to his ways. Why? Because my ways are not like his ways. His ways are above and far beyond my comprehension. But somehow, leading all to this point, I have been eating bread and water of adversity and affliction, and suddenly I realize that perhaps that was given to me to bring me to the reality of the voice that is speaking behind me, that is calling to me, that's telling me, this was done at my hand, but I will deliver you. This was done at my hand, but I want you to pay attention. Look at how far you are ahead of me. How can you even be following me? When you're, you ever walk with somebody and they're, you know, you, you think you're walking together and suddenly that person is, <laughs> they, they are whew, far, far away from you. You ever, you ever have that happen? Could be your spouse does that to you. <laughs> and then suddenly you know, that person looks back and they see that they've been speed walking or maybe you're just a snail. <laughs> but the distance has been created. And maybe in the distance you're saying, hey, big crowd of people, hey, whoever, you, whoever you're calling, they can't even hear you. And if they do, it's very, very faint. This is what this is saying. But if you'll pay attention, God is the one calling. He's saying, I haven't forsaken you. The great shepherd of our souls never leads us astray. He'll let us stray. He doesn't say, because you follow me, I guarantee that you'll never. But he still shepherds us even when we are afar off. Think of the things I've told you from the New Testament. Sheep will wander. Jesus tells the parable of the one leaving the 99 to go after the one. That is the life of the saint. There is no perfect person except for Jesus. There is no perfect, I will stay on the path and I will not go astray or I will not I'll walk at a, Lord I promise I'll walk at a certain rate and I'll be with you and I'll pay attention let me last for that moment right there that it was uttered and the next day it may be gone so my point in telling you all this is to say if you came here today or if you've had a week that just seems like the week from hell even though we're celebrating today what I'm celebrating is telling you there's some good news here you know they sang about you know, many of the things that are dear to my heart when we talk about a happy day and how 
He took our sins away, washed our sins away. I think about the blood of Jesus and the cross that, albeit agonizing in some respects to look at, but it's the very thing that lifts up not only my Lord and Savior, but lifts up the soul of man, the ability to look to the source of strength and know I have none, that the greatest ideas they may have fall infinitely short of anything that the Lord could possibly do in my life. And we're talking about God's people and God's plan for his people. There must be one key factor that comes into play. If the soul is troubled, if the turmoil has been ongoing and it hasn't stopped, you rest, return and rest. That R&R that comes from him is that wonderful gift, he says, now I'll get busy entering into the problems. And I just told you what happened, how the angel of the Lord went out. They were looking at this army saying, oh my goodness. But can you imagine, just indulge me, had for a moment Sennacherib sent out spies and said, go check out these people and go see what they're doing. Now, I'll give you two scenarios. Here are the people of God and they are scared and they're running around and thinking, oh, wow, how do we fix this tool and how do we, uh, you know, how do we make this weapon and Imagine the spies are looking at those people and they're saying, wow, this is going to be a pushover. This will be done in five minutes and we can get back to our, whatever, conquering someplace else. Or they look upon the city and they see the people and the people are going about their business day to day as if nothing is going on. Why? Because they have the confidence. They have the stillness and the quietness. They are resting in the Lord. That takes faith to know that no matter what, the Lord's going to fight their battles, and no matter what enemy comes against them, the Lord will be there as their banner, as their strength. The Lord of hosts will fight your battles for you as long as your faith is focused and not, I'm not scattering to try and figure out, how do I get myself out of this thing? Now, the wonder of this is, as I said, the angel of the Lord went out there and basically put an end to all that crazy stuff. Just like that, 185,000 are wiped out. What I want to tell you today is the same God who did that for those will do for you when you come to that fresh reality. It's very difficult sometimes because sometimes we don't even know we've gotten ahead and we've gotten far away. We think we're still walking and we're still close to him. But let me ask you something. Are you really close to God? And you may say, well, careful, pastor. Okay. I speak for myself, but I want you to consider this. Are you really close to God when you spend your time in anger or in fear? God's not the author of fear. Are you walking close to God when you spend your time in bitterness? What did Paul say in Ephesians 4, 32? Put away all bitterness, clamor, all of that. He put it all away, forgiving one another for Christ's sake. That's why I said to you, you know, it's easy to have the lip service and say, oh, you know, I'm a child of God and, you know, this is, uh, this is how I'm going to operate. Well, isn't this what got these people so far away from God that God had to tell them, listen to the voice behind you. It's me talking to you. And you probably may or may not be able to hear me because you've been so far in front of me instead of letting me lead you. When Christ called his disciples, he said, follow me. He didn't say, okay, troops. March on, go ahead of me. He said, follow me. And Christ is still speaking to us today the same way, to follow him. And that requires, by the way, tenacity to stay in the word of God, to abide in the word, and to stay in that mindset. I'm following, do we sing this? I'm following Jesus each step of the way. Well, tell me, how are you following Jesus when you've gotten so far ahead of everything you no longer care about what's behind, what's around. You're just plowing through at your own speed, probably in the flesh. So I want to read something to you that was perfectly made for Isaiah's uh, issues and the people of the day. Strangely enough, it comes out of Lord Byron's writing, uh, the great writer. And I had to make a copy and blow it up because this requires bionic eyes. <laughs> But I believe this is from 1815. Listen to what the poet said, and then I'll be done, because it's enough to say 
that if he could understand it and we get the message, we know who's in control. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. His cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue waves roll nightly on deep Galilee. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed on the face of the foe as he passed. The eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. My God can do anything, including leading and guiding a person like me who has trusted all these years in his grace, provision, for his love, for his comfort, for his great love wherewith he loved me. He is indeed the great burden bearer. You bring it to him. You don't walk around trying to fix. You don't try and lean on the flesh. You don't, at some point, you just say, Lord, this is yours. I may have messed it up big time, but I recognize I messed up what's yours. Straighten out the mess, please, because I can't. And I can't fix these problems, but you can. The lesson of those in Isaiah's day, it was learned temporarily as God acted in that moment. We know full well what happens to the Assyrians and their kingdom, which basically disappears, vanishes. The only thing that is left of the Assyrians in terms of historical peoples are the reliefs and the antiquities that they left behind. But the people as we know them in the Bible, they're gone, much like we talk about Egyptian culture. Oh, you can go to the land and you can see the great monuments, but, and the people have existed, but we're talking about dynastic empires that basically just disappeared with the traces of history. Why? God said, they too will meet their fate. And for the children of God, he says, if you'll just return and rest, that R&R concept in quietness and in confidence, that'll be your strength. I'll take care of the rest. You figure out how to trust me. And when I say, I've got it, God speaking, I've got it. That means your burdens are cast upon him, and he's going to help you. He's not going to leave you there, but he does want one thing. Quit carrying them around with you and quit fussing on them and recognize whatever those issues are, whatever you're looking at, the promises of God are greater than anything that can come. What is the, book, what is the, the promise that we oft quote? Greater is he, no weapon formed against us. All of those combined say the Lord is in control, and I will trust him. Why? He's trustworthy. He's more than proven that abundantly over, over time. But if he never proved himself, I've got the book to say the Lord came through for these people when they finally stopped their insanity and started listening again, even if it was just for a time. The Lord delivered them mightily. He will deliver you too. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.